Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the wonderful name of Jesus. It's good to see everybody here this morning in person and through the eye of a camera as well. Welcome to Living Word Church on this October morning. It's good to see everybody here. And uh, November, I, wow, I tell you what, I have a, I'm looking at November. Thank you. Brother Whitaker, I, that's, what would I do without you? It's November 1st. See, you lose an hour. Or you, is it we gain an hour? I don't even know. We lost an hour. I'm losing my marbles. I'm losing something. Pray for me. But I can just keep it all together. It's, it gets people all wacky, I tell you what, when you start changing the, uh, the times on us. And, you know, I'm thankful for the extra hour of sleep, but I looked at the... My clock shines up onto my, my ceiling, so I'm lazy and I don't have to roll over and look at it. So I can just stare at the ceiling and know what time it is. And I was like, man, it is bright outside and it is, uh, it seems like it's later than what it really is. And it sure enough was. I was trying to remind everybody else about, about that, that we, gain, we get an extra hour of sleep. And I forgot all about it and I woke myself up. I, I cut myself short. But... That being said, I'll get off my soapbox there on that. We'll get into the announcements for the remainder of the week. Um, please be mindful tonight, 6.30 is our second service here at Living Word. Um, tomorrow night at 6.30 is Sugar and Spice. Please get with Sister Natalie and her wonderful team um, as they uh, have everything planned out for tomorrow evening, ladies and young ladies, Sugar and Spice. It will be another remember... Uh, Memorable one, as you always do, and you always have great turnouts. Um, the following Monday is Max Men's Fellowship and dinner here at the church at uh, 6.30 as well. Um, Tuesday and Thursday, Pastor's Prayer here in the sanctuary, 10 a.m. If you're able to be here, we'd love to have you here and be able to just spend another time with the Lord in prayer. Um, but we invite you, all those that are able to come. Uh, looking a little bit further ahead, this Friday is Families of Faith Prayer and Praise meeting here in the sanctuary at 7 o'clock. So there will be nothing at the beginning for the youth in the back because we're all going to be gathered together as families here. We will have um, food afterwards that's being sold by one of the ministry teams and um, it'll be very affordable. Again, I encourage everybody that's able to be here board games, things like that in the back. Everybody has a good time. Social distancing as well. Um, and everything is also subject to change at a moment's notice as we have seen. Who was ready for that snow this week? Anybody? Brother Sanchez was ready for the snow. Dwayne was ready for the snow. Good job, Dwayne, I tell you what. Uh, I was not ready for that snow. Um, it was uh, took me off guard. I mean, I, I heard about it, but I didn't believe it. Um, I was like, no way in October are we going to get snow. I can't remember the last time in October we got snow, let alone that much snow. I think that, that equated our whole winter's worth of snow here in New Mexico, um, but definitely was much needed, and I'll take more of it. That's all right. It's that good snow. It's a disappearing snow. It's, it's uh, as, as the people up in, in the northeast they, they like that kind of snow because you don't really have to shovel it. You don't have to do much with it. It just disappears. It's so nice. Enjoy it and it disappears. But that's New Mexico for you. That's all the announcements we have for the remainder of the week. And then next weekend we do it all over again here at the church. Amen. Well, we're going to go to the word of the Lord here this morning. I feel the times that we're living in are just... Things are so fluid and everything's moving around so quick, but I tell you what, there is something that is going on within the body of Christ throughout this world, and it's very disturbing, actually. More and more people today are walking away from the faith than ever before. They say with the millennials that kids uh, in people ages from 25 all the way up to 38 um, they don't view it as necessary to even have any kind of religious belief because they weren't raised with one. Um, it's upwards of over 50% of people right now that profess Christianity as their faith are walking away. Right now, somebody is walking away from and leaving the race that they started on. 
And to me, it just troubles me within my spirit, but it also, to me, it also lets me know that we are getting closer and closer to the coming of the Lord than ever before. I, I truly believe it, and I know that God is coming back for a church that is ready for his return. So more than ever, we need to be ready. And we need to, as my title says, we need to keep your want alive. Your want alive. We need to keep our want alive or our desire. You could change that word want out and put your desire, but it needs to be your want to. You have to have that want to to be able to do anything in life. And we more than ever have to keep that alive. It's that desire, that perseverance that keeps us moving forward. We're going to go to the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 to start out. I'm going to be reading from the God's Word version, but follow with me in your King James or whatever version you have in your laps right now or on the screens. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, Since we are surrounded by so many examples of faith, we must get rid of everything that slows us down, especially sin that distracts us. And believe me, you, sin will distract you long enough to take you out. We must run the race that lies ahead of us. We must focus on Jesus. Jesus has to be the center focus of our lives and our walk in this world. The source and goal of our faith. He saw the joy ahead of him, so he endured death on the cross and ignored the disgrace it brought him. Then he received the highest position in heaven, the one next to the throne of God. Let me start by saying winning is not everything. Winning is not everything. Though society has taught us differently and says, if you're not winning, guess what? You're a loser. Though this may be true, it's not. I mean, who doesn't like to win, right? But we need to look at it from a different perspective. And looking at it at from the perspective of keeping our want or our desire alive. There was a man, if I mention his name, which I will, Urshan Bolt. He was an Olympic sprinter. He did not win his first race. He lost several races, but his want to win made him the best athlete in his field, in the world. Even when Michael Phelps, one of the greatest swimmers of all time, when he started swimming, guess what? He did not win his first swim race. They both lost several races before they could taste their first win. If both these legends had the attitude of winning is everything, then they would not have been they would have not even qualified for the olympics they would have lost their want a long time ago from that first loss even their second loss even their third loss if they would have gave up guess what you'll never achieve unless you keep going we too ha um, have to sometimes suffer some defeats before we can taste our first victory but remember, winning is not everything. It's the keeping your want alive. Our motto as a church should be, stay motivated at all times. If we suffer a defeat, always remember that though I have been defeated once, I am still keeping my want alive. The mark of a winner is his or her heart, the will to win. The drive, the determination. You can have a gifted athlete who has all the potential in the world, but if they don't have the will or the want to win, they won't stick around. We have to keep our want alive. I tell you what, I would rather take somebody with a, a burning passion, a desire, and a drive than that of somebody that is the most talented person because that person that has that drive will push themselves past the limitations where they think they can't have to stop and where they can't go on. 
I remember back when I was in high school, our coach said, I still remember him telling us this. He says, you are not the most talented individuals in the state of New Mexico as a wrestling team. This is not the way to motivate your, your, your group of guys that's standing in front of you telling them, you are not what I was looking for, but I'll do, I'll work with you guys. <laughs> Good luck. But I still remember that it, it, you, we have never won in Del Norte's history. That's where we went to high school. You, we have never won a, a state championship wrestling um, title ever. Boy, he, he was really good at motivating us. He says, you may not be the most talented individuals out there, but you will be the hardest working individuals out there because we're going to persevere and we're going to push forward. And you're going to outwork those really talented people and work circles around them. And guess what? That's exactly how we won. Del Norte had won their first title. It was my junior year. Is because we outworked people. We, pers we persevered. Our want, we kept it alive. We didn't let our, our coach just deflate us, but it was meant to actually propel us to want to work hard. To know that, hey, guess what? Our, our, our ability isn't going to be able to get us there, but our want to is going to get us there. And that's the exact way how we're going to get to heaven. It's not by our ability, but it's by our want to and our drive to get to heaven. We have to be more determined than ever before today in today's world with all the distractions. Am I the only one that sees the distractions in this world? There are so many distractions, it will make your head spin and spin and spin and spin. There's so many things, bright lights and fancy this and big that and who cares? I just want to focus on Jesus. I really do. But I get distracted too at times. I really do. I have one of those wandering minds that is very active or overactive. And if you haven't noticed, I go down bunny trails every once in a while, most of the time. But I tell you, I have to, we have to rein ourselves back and stay focused on the prize that's set before us. Ecclesiastes 9.11 says, The race is not to the swift, as said in the NIV version. What makes the difference? What gives the one who wins the edge? It's heart. It's desire. It's the want. A person must be willing to overcome obstacles in order to win. What we believers do is up to each of us. What is the anatomy of our heart? And Sister Moore, don't tell me what the anatomy of the heart is. I tell you what, she's going to give me a doctor's version of it. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a muscle, it's blood pumping, it's... Are you determined in your pursuit of the ultimate prize? Is heaven your ultimate prize? Is being with Jesus your ultimate prize? I told the young people back here in, the, in the, uh, the Christian Academy here this week, the fear of hell should not be the reason you want to go to heaven. It should not be the reason you want to go to heaven. I just want to stay out of hell. That's why I want to go to heaven. No, your love for Jesus Christ and him being your focal point in your life should be the reason that you want to go to heaven. I know that hell is a real place and it's prepared for Satan, Lucifer, the devil, whatever you want to call him, and his fallen angels. That's who it was designed for. It was not designed for mankind. It was designed for the fallen angels that had pride and came up against God. But through time and through sin, it's now become a place that is going to accommodate those who choose to go there. Just like you choose to be, you have to choose to be chosen by God, you will choose to go to hell. It's a choice. You choose it. God doesn't choose it. His will is that everybody should be with him in heaven. His, his, his draw is that everybody would be with him worshiping amongst in heaven on the streets of gold. 
That's what God, God does not want to send one person. I don't care if they, they did the, the most horrific thing in this entire world. He doesn't want to send anybody to hell. But he wants to receive them into heaven. But we have to be determined in our pursuit of the ultimate prize. Nothing else in this world really matters. Nothing else in this world really matters. And we need more than ever to keep our want alive. So what does scripture say about keeping our want alive? Again, we're going to go to some more scriptures here. Micah 7 and verse 8. Micah 7 and verse 8. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Proverbs 24 and verse 16 says in the God's Word version, a righteous person may fall seven times, but he gets up again. And I put emphasis on that right there at the end, but he gets up or she gets up again. Our righteousness is not within ourselves alone, but it rests in Christ Jesus only. We get our righteousness from the righteous God and not from ourselves. But he gives us the strength to be able to get back up. Though you've been knocked down and, and the world has basically drug you around like a, a rag doll, that's okay, saint of God. Get up. Get up. Dust yourself off. Though it might be hard, though it might be inconvenient, though my, people might be looking at you funny and saying, I can't believe it. It's the sign of a champion, one that will get up. And we as Christians need to get up and stand up and move forward. I get it. We all suffer some small and even some big defeats in our lives. We are faced by life and its challenges. Some small and even some great challenges face us. Your giant might be smaller than somebody else's so-called giant, but it's still a giant. We must keep our want alive. Do you struggle with motivation? I do sometimes. When you fall, is it hard to get back up? You may say, it seems like I've fallen so many times, I don't even have the strength to get back up. And sometimes even the want to get back up. Anybody ever struggle like that before? I have. There's been times in my life where I've been beat down, drug around, where I just like, God, I, I just leave me here. This is as far as I'm going to be able to go. I don't have the strength to push myself up. I don't have the strength to endure any further. I'm just going to lay right here. Now, does God turn his back on us and say, well, I'm continuing on. You stay here and have your pity party. I'm talking about myself right now. Stephen, you have yourself your pity party, okay? And when you're not so prideful laying there, you ask me and just, I'll give you the help to get back up. I'll pick you up if you'll ask me. Lord, I need, when we get to those points, we have to have that desire and that want to, but to even have the humbleness to say, Lord, I can't do it on my own. I need your strength to pick me up. And God will pick you up. He will support your weight. He will carry you. He will keep you moving forward as long as you keep your want alive. The scripture states a righteous person falls seven times, but the reason they are righteous is not because of themselves. Again, I say, but it's because it comes from God. Our strength is not within ourselves. I don't care how much you think you can lift and how many push-ups you can do or, or sit-ups. I tell you what, that strength just in the physical realm is not even on your own accord anyway. It's because the breath of God has been put into your body and God has given you the strength to be able to do all that, those things. So ultimately, all the glory and all the honor go back to God anyway. 
but we have to do our part in it as well. We have to have the desire and the want and keep it alive. In such difficult times, digging deep for inspiration is important. You, people have always heard, oh, you've got to dig deep, Brother Renteria. You've got to dig deep and reach down to the depths down there and to be able to pull this, this perseverance out that you've never had before, this determination that you're going to press forward. While I was studying for this, I was looking at some videos and stuff like that and marathon runners and this one marathon runner, I, I won't forget it because, man, he was at the absolute end and he fell and he could see the finish line before him. Man, he was trying to get back up and he was dragging himself. He fell down again and at the very end, he started rolling. If all you can do is roll forward, roll forward. <laughs> Amen. Roll forward. But then what was remarkable was as he was rolling forward and some of the other contestants were passing him by, just running by this guy like, man, I'm going to beat him. <laughs> if really, if that's how, how it is, you're going to beat somebody rolling and you really, did, you really didn't beat him in the first place. <laughs> They're rolling at that point. They have mercy for you and pity. But finally, one guy stops and he grabs this guy. And he's just, the guy's staggering. He's stumbling right there. And he throws his arm over him. And he's, and he's pointing to the finish line. we got to make it. And he actually pushes him forward to finish before himself. That was just one of the videos that I had watched. Man, somebody else, seeing somebody else struggling in their faith and then getting the help to be able to move forward. Oh, hey, guess what? I'm here. We'll, we'll finish together. We're going to make it across that finish line together. You're not going to quit. You've come too far. The finish line is right before us. We have to dig deep. We have to remain self-motivated at times, but also to encourage others. Passion and purpose always go hand in hand, and success and happiness follows. If we have passion and purpose, our passion should be Jesus, and our purpose should be the one that pleases Jesus. We love to live for ourselves in the society today. It's all about me, 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 I, I, I. But let's look at Matthew 10, verses 38 and 39. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. That's our purpose. Jesus is our purpose. Take up your cross, church. We've already taken it up when we first started believing and we repented and we were baptized in Jesus' name and we were filled with the Holy Ghost by the evidence of speaking in other tongues. We started to pick up and to carry the cross. But like I said before, there are so many Christians or so-called Christians today that are laying down their crosses and turning around and going away from the path and the race that they were once were running. It's easier for me just to set up camp right here. This looks like a nice spot. Look, there's a little creek and, 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 and a nice meadow and a house already built for me. Look, I'll just live here. Well, that's not where God intended for you to live. If he said that he went to go prepare a place for us, he went to go prepare a place for us. But our job is to be able to get to that place to be able to reach our goal, to be able to get to heaven, and to keep our want alive. Philippians 3, 7 through 9 says, But what things were gained to me that I counted loss for Christ? Ye doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. We have to church, 
lay down our wants and our desires to be able to pick up the cross. You can't carry them both because you'll be like that one that's trying to serve two masters. The Bible says it's impossible to serve two masters. As you become a Christian, as you grow within Christ, your desires start to fade away because your true desire starts to be his desire. Is our conversation continually pointing people to Christ? Or is it continually pointing people to self? I don't want you to see me up here. I want you to see Jesus, the living word. It's not about me. It never was about me. And guess what? It's not about you. It's about Jesus. It will always be about Jesus. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. He is the one that this word, it's, it's all about him. But yet we get distracted and we start to turn it around and say it's all about me. Me, me, my desires. Now, I'm not saying, yes, go out and sell everything that you have and live in a paper sack so when it rains, it'll get soggy, then you won't have a place to live. No, I'm not telling you that. We are still able to enjoy a lot of things here on this life while we're in this life. But if our main focus is to get more, so that we have more and that we die with more, that is the wrong perspective to be driven to. But too many people today are driven by that materialism to where the more I have, the more I have, and, and guess what? The one with the most toys at the end wins. Wrong. The one with the most t toys at the end still dies. We're living for the then and the later, not for the here and the now. We're living to get to our goal but we have to keep our want alive. Because nothing in this world will ever, ever compare with Jesus. Not all the money in the world, not all the riches, not the fanciest cars, not the biggest house. You could have the biggest mansion and have servants and everything, and it will still just dwindle in comparison with Jesus. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. That's what it's about, church. We should have a passion for Jesus and his word and want that desire to share it with other people more than ever. But again, you say, I go through life and I get knocked down. I suffer defeat after defeat after defeat after defeat. It seems like that's all I do is just suffer defeat. And I'm tired of getting back up. I encourage you, Get back up because you're almost at the finish line. Galatians 6 and verse 9 says in the God's words, you cannot allow yourselves to get tired of living the right way. Certainly each of us will receive everlasting life at the proper time. Here it is right here. This is what we put emphasis on. If we do not give up, you got to keep your want alive. You cannot give up. We cannot give up church now in the time that we're living in. So many people are worn out and they're dying to self. And they're just falling away, shriveling up, rolling off the road saying, I'll just live here. There was a Spanish runner back in 2013. He trailed the Olympic bronze medalist Abel Mutai of Kenya during an event. Matai slowed as he neared the finish line, believing that he had won because he had seen signs and because there was a lack of understanding there, he, he, he's getting there and he stops. Anaya approached Matai from behind and motioned him. You got to keep going forward. You're almost there. You didn't finish yet. Though there might have been, there was a language barrier that was there, he said. He still was pushing him, encouraging him, telling him, you got to finish the race. Everyone was encouraged by Anaya's, you know, his, his, his display of true sportsmanship. They said, why didn't you just pass him and win? He said, if I would have passed him, would it really have been winning? He already had a long enough lead that was on me that I couldn't have caught him if I wanted to. 
So I encouraged him to continue on and to finish the race. I mean, he could have been a bronze medalist. He could have had all these accolades. I mean, the bronze, gold, silver, and bronze, the third place. Third place, you're excited. Silver, you're not really that excited. You're like, I was that close. Seriously, I made it right there. I almost won. I mean, silver medal, you're throwing it away. You're like, man, I'm the first loser. I was right there. I was on his coattails. I was ready to beat him, and he beat me. The bronze medalists, they're jumping up and down. They're like, yeah, I actually got a medal. I came in third place. It's kind of like the middle child always gets forgotten about. No offense, Malachi. I remembered him. Cute little guy. He's always smiling. It's hard. He, he's got a personality that he will not let you forget about him. Some middle children are like that, but I tell you what, he's just right there. He's like, hey, you're not forgetting about me. Check me out. He could have been the baby of the family, but he's not because Matthias won't let us forget about him either. The year was 490 BC. On the plains near the small town of Marathon, the ancient Greeks met the invading Persian army in the battle. If the Persians won, the Greek empire would topple. Against all odds, the Greeks chain charged into the Persian camp, caught their enemy by surprise, defeating the Persians, and saved the Greek empire. The Greek soldier named Pheidippides was dispatched to run the ar to army headquarters in Athens, 22 miles away, with the good news. With determination and resolve, he ran all night long from Marathon to Athens. Pheidippides um, became a Greek hero, the symbol of determination and endurance. As a tribute to this faithful soldier who ran so bravely through the night, the marathon race was born. In the same way, Pheidippides was consumed by the determination to reach his goal at Athens. Believers in Christ must be consumed with the passion to serve him to the very end, the goal of our lives. Are you hungering or thirsting after righteousness? Does your soul yearn for the Lord? Are you consumed with the desire to serve him? That's what it takes to be a spiritual winner in a Christian life. We have to have our want alive. It's not all about winning here on earth, but it's about keeping going. A Christian must preserve to the end of his life. Have you ever heard the saying, winners never quit, quitters never win? Christians never quit. We may be tempor temporarily hampered by obstacles in life, but we're, knocked, we're never knocked out of the race of life. We may be knocked down, but not knocked out. James 1 and verse 12 says, Blessed are those who endure when they are tested. When they pass the test, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Are there things that are hindering us or even encouraging us to stop this race that we're running? Like issues of life, hurt feelings, unimportant things, distractions? We can't be hindered, church. We have to keep going. We look even at those who seem to succeed and have victories or so. It seems that they have victories in their lives. And guess what? They aren't even living for the Lord. So we say, if they can get these so-called victories and not even live for the Lord, guess what? I'm going to quit and I'm going to join them. But Psalms 37, 7 says, Surrender yourselves to the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Do not be preoccupied with an evildoer who succeeds in his ways when he carries out his schemes. We cannot be preoccupied and look at that because it takes our eyes off of the goal. This is when our tank seems empty and, our just want, and we just want to throw the towel in we want to give up and lie down. 
right when you're at the bottom. I tell you what, I, I tried to, I went on a hunt this year, and everybody knows that, and I went running with, with my brother. I had only ran three miles previously, trying to get myself in shape, and he says, we're going to go five miles. And I said, that's almost double what I run. Do you look at me? I'm not built as a runner. You, you need glasses. You're being deceived. He says, no, you can do it. We can, we can, we, we can get you going. We're going we're gonna to run. I said, I only run three miles. <laughs> he says, we're going to run five. So we started out and we're running. And it's a lot easier when you have somebody right there next to you and we're running. And, and man, my legs are starting to get tired. And I'm like, have we hit three miles yet? Because that's, 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 that's as far as I can go. And he keeps encouraging me. Come on, we're going to keep going. We're going to keep going. And finally, we make it all the way around, and, and we're, we're making it. He's, my legs were cramping a little bit. He says, it's, if, we, if we stop, you won't want to keep going, so just keep, at least just keep a little bit of a walk. So we walked for a little, uh, just a short distance, and then we get to this other gate, and he says, now we're going to sprint. We're going to what? We're going to sprint back to the house, mom and dad's house. And I said, you're crazy. He says, no, come on, you can do it. Dig deep. I dug somewhere. I tell you what, I don't know if it was deep. I think it was like subgrade. It was below deep. I dug, and he's, he's encouraging me, and we're running, and we get there, and then he tells me this and just demoralized me. He says, yeah, you go ahead and go, because I was like, I have to leave and stuff. And we got back there, and I was all excited. Hey, I, I made it. He says, I'm going to go run another five miles. Totally just wiped out everything I just did. I'm like, that's ridiculous. Another five miles. I just want to die at this point. I dug deep. <laughs> we get to those points in life where we've been knocked down so much that we want to quit our job. We want to quit our responsibilities. We want to even sometimes quit living. This is something that not a lot of people are talking about today. Loneliness and the suicide rate is at one of the highest this world has ever seen. It truly is. Oh, we can't talk about that in church. Yes, we can. If we see a brother and a sister hurting in the Lord, we need to be there reaching out to them, encouraging them, helping them through it, and not persecuting them because of it. What's happening is their want is dying, and they want to lay down and die themselves. That's the point where we as Christians, we need to step in there as brothers and sisters say, you can't give up. Not be like, I can't believe you're having those kind of thoughts. We need to be there to help, to encourage, to uplift each other. We're living in such a hard time right now. People are worn down more than they've ever been worn down in their entire lives. But I tell you, as a household of faith, as saints of God, we have to encourage one another. We have to encourage other people out there that they can make it with Jesus. We have to. We can't stop. Now is not the time to quit. Endurance is the key. Stick it out and remember, God does not care about the short sprinters. He cares about the long marathon run. Just keep going. Put one foot in front of the other, like, like my brother was telling me. Just keep, don't stop. Just one foot in front of the other. Even if it's a walk, if it's a crawl, if it's a roll, keep moving forward. In Bob Whelan's world, obstacles create opportunities and conquests breed inspiration. Whelan was declared dead and taken away in a zipped-up body bag in 1969 after stepping on a mortar mine in Vietnam. But he awoke a half hour later, and now breath lives into him again. Missing his legs, but full of heart, Whelan has competed in six marathons on his hands. He finished the Ironman World Championship Triathlon course in Hawaii less than seven in less in less than five days. In 1986, New York City Marathon, where there was almost 20,000 contestants, runners, entered a, that race. What was memorable was not who won, because who knows who won unless you really look it up, but what 
was inspiring was who finished last. His name was Bob Whelan. He finished 19,413th place, dead last. Bob completed the marathon in four days, two hours, 47 minutes, and 17 seconds. It was unquestionably the slowest marathon in history ever. He sat on a 15 pound saddle and covered his fists with pads and impact material. He used his arms to catapult himself forward one arm length at a time. He can move himself and do a mile in about an hour. That is real endurance in the face of adversity. He said, I finished, look at this kind of attitude. I finished ahead of 300 million Americans who never finished the race. He didn't see himself at 19,413. He saw himself ahead of 300 million people because they never even entered or ran the race. He had also said, I lost my legs, but I didn't lose my heart. I didn't lose my want. And that's why I fell in love with New York, he said, to do the marathon. A lot of people have legs, but too many people have lost their heart. They've lost their want. Remember this. We may get to the finish line and be battered and beaten and even missing limbs when we get to our eternal reward. It may look like we've gone through, as they would say, hell on earth. We're standing there just torn apart, our clothes battered. We've gone through defeat after defeat after defeat, but we've also gone through victory after victory after victory. We've got back up, we've dusted ourselves off, and we've continued forward. We have to endure and keep our want alive to receive our reward. We are empowered by the Holy Ghost who strengthens us and helps us to endure. We have all the tools necessary to finish. And if we finish, we win. We start our race full of energy, zealous, and we're ready to go. We're like a fireball ready to just be shot out and we're just going. As we encounter hills and valleys, we tend to lose our momentum. We tend to lose our endurance. We tend to start losing our momentum that we had built up that was so fast at the beginning. But don't let that slow you down. There will be hills. There will be mountaintops, but there will be valleys. Use the backside of your hill as a spot to gain momentum so that you can get back up on the other hill that you're about to go up. Don't give up. Your lungs may be, seem like they're on fire. Your legs may feel like they're about to give out, but don't give up. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Here's something very revelatory for us to hear and very needful after a message like this. God did not tell us to keep up. He said, keep going. Everybody's moving at different paces. Like I said, myself and my brother, I tell you what, if he runs, he's going to leave me in the, in the dust if he runs at the speed where he runs. But guess what? The speed that I'm running at is the speed that I'm running at. What matters is that I finish the race. It's not my time because God has already ordained that time. It's that I keep going and that I persevere. So don't worry about keeping up. Just keep going. Keep your want alive at all costs. And if you see a brother and a sister struggling, be like these other people that I've described in, the, in these illustrations here. Get behind them. Grab them by the seat of the pants, I tell you what, and, and push them along. Help them through there. They might not have the strength to continue on, but just by feeling or hearing that word of a brother and sister, encouraging them, telling them, we can make it, we're almost, 
there. We're at the finish line. Can you see them? They're all cheering. Banners are, are waving. The, 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 the ribbon is right across there. They're waiting for us. Oh, but they've already let other people fit. It doesn't matter. We have to finish. Encourage yourself and others. And keep your and their want alive. God bless you.